So, of course, we are here to celebrate the publication of the Apollo Murders, which comes out on um, October the 12th. And uh, it is a really fascinating and engaging book. And it marks Chris's transition into the thriller genre. So you may have read his previous books about life as an astronaut, but he brings everything together in this new book. And, you know, it has the thrills of space flight and who better to tell this story um, than a former commander of the International Space Station, um, a Capcom who, um, who is the voice of mission control, which Chris was for over 25 space shuttle flights. So he has this wealth of experience and character to bring into this novel. So please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome. And hopefully he will appear on the screen as if by magic, Chris Hadfield. <laughs> Brilliant, he's there. Oh. <laughs> Yes. Great, great. Hello, Lucy. It, it is a delight to be joining you. How are you this evening? I'm very good, thank you. Could you give us just a kind of two-minute overview of the story? How would you sum it up? Okay, the Apollo murders. It's 1973, and the Soviets have a secret spy space station. And this is true. It was called Almaz, and it had tremendous camera capability. NASA oh, has had their last you. space mission to the moon canceled by Nixon because of financial reasons. But because of the pressures of not only of the Soviet spy space station, but also what's happening on the moon, Nixon gets the US Air Force to put in some money so that they could combine and have a military moon mission with astronauts who used to be part of the secret American space station program called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. And that is true as well. And the, the story of the mission is the crew uh, training their, the main character in it is named Kaz Zemeckis. And he would have been an astronaut, one of the military astronauts, but he was injured in an accident. So he's their person on the ground. The crew launches. There's some amazing things that happen uh, when they're uh, going near the, uh, the Soviet space station, Almaz. And then they head to the moon with some pretty surprising twists of plot. And then this uh, Soviet experiment on the moon mysteriously malfunctions and dies. And that really happened. And then the whole climax of the book is when, when it comes back and splashes down into the Pacific, just north of Hawaii, where uh, again, some, some pretty surprising and amazing things happen. So about, gosh, so much of the book is real. And I, I got to interweave all of my plot elements through the reality of what was happening in the spring of 73. And, and it made it such a joy and a challenge and a real learning experience for me to write this year. So could you give us some examples, you know, obviously without spoilers for us, but some examples of parts of the book that are, you know, some really nice um, juicy bits about experiences that, that you've had directly? Sure. For the Apollo program, it was a test program and extremely dangerous. And we killed several people in training and in preparation for flight. And we almost killed the crew of Apollo 13. So it required a, a really specific skill set to be an astronaut in the 60s and the 70s. And everybody was, or pretty much everybody, was a, uh, a engineer military test pilot because they had you know, test pilots die all the time. It's a very dangerous, complex technical profession. And, and so that's not just the psychology, but the technocracy of who was on board. And I was a military fighter pilot during the Cold War. I was a combatant. I intercepted Soviet bombers off the coast. But I was also a test pilot with both the US Air Force and the US Navy, even though I'm Canadian. And so the background, the underpinning, the the, the training that the astronauts went through, all of that is either based on something that happened to me or something that happened to a good friend of mine. Um, and then launch, of course. I've, I've been part of the flight crew of three different rocket ships leaving Earth. And so to be able to describe what the, I, I didn't fly the Saturn V, which was the Apollo rocket, but I did fly the space shuttle. And I, I didn't fly the Proton, which is the big unmanned Soviet rocket, but I did fly the Soyuz, 
And so the locations and the feelings and the, the buildup to it, and then the actual physical ride uh, is, was, you know, it doesn't matter which rocket you're on, there's a lot of similarity there. Um, the, the immediate moments of weightlessness, going outside on a spacewalk. I, I was Canada's first spacewalker. In, in fact, we celebrate it here. It's on our $5 bill. Um, I got to unveil that bill weightless in orbit while I was on the space <laughs> station. Um, but the, the actual feeling of being outside on a spacewalk, what you actually worry about, what, what, you know, what does it sound like? What does it smell like? What are you thinking? Uh, it gave me the freedom to talk about that. And then re-entering through the atmosphere, of course. I've done it twice on the space shuttle, which was slightly more genteel because the shuttle had wings. And then on my third flight, I came in in a capsule, just like the crew in the Apollo murders, a small three-person capsule. And, and, then, uh, and then I've done lots of water entry things, sea survival. So the fact that Apollo did a splashdown, I did my splashdown training in the Black Sea just um, off of Sochi and off of Sevastopol. So, so all of those uh, experiences that are necessary for the telling of the Apollo murders, those are all based to a very large degree on my own personal experiences. It was really nice. I, I didn't have to phone a friend to, to look up most things. <laughs> I, I, you know, it put me in an almost unique position in the world to be a writer and a, a test pilot astronaut to be able to put together the Apollo murders. So I wanted to um, to bring up a kind of well a, an environmental aspect because the Apollo era was obviously the time when we were first able from the distance of the moon to look back at the Earth, reflect on it as a fragile planet in the darkness of space, and I'm kind of you know minded to ask about this now because we had the launch of Landsat this week as well, which continues NASA's trajectory in, in Earth observations and, and caring, get, like gathering data to care for, for the planet. So, I mean, did orbiting the Earth, did, did going into space also give you that feeling of wanting to, you know, protect our, our planet more? Did you feel some kind of fragility of the planet that, that you weren't able to recognize on, on the ground? Absolutely. I mean, if you grew up in and around London, it's very difficult to imagine most of the world. You, you can take someone else's word for it, but, you know, picture Indonesia or uh, the Pacific Ocean or, you know, anything, the Antarctica. To actually go around the world, just floating weightless, silently, coasting around the world for months, um, you truly get an understanding of how exquisite the world is, how small it is. If you can go around it in an hour and a half, it's not very big. And how tough it is, how ancient it is. You can see the scars of four and a half billion years of formation. You become acutely aware of life being there because you can see all the little infestations, you know, every, anywhere that there's heat and wet, there's life on earth. It's sort of like if you look under your sink, you know, look at that little hot <laughs> wet spot and there's, there's something growing there. That's, that's how we've infested the world as well with all different types of life. And, and so you sort of get aware of the, the harm that we can do. Um, it, the classic bellwether is the Aral Sea, the fourth biggest sea on Earth. And in one human generation, we have dried up the fourth biggest sea on Earth because of our own short-sighted, unsustainable uh, water management policies and agricultural policies. And, and that has had international climate impacts. You know, it's dried up the RLC, so huge uh, local regional ecosystem. And then where the wind used to pick up the water and, and put it into the mountains, so, so the snowpack in the Kazakh mountains, that's not there anymore. And so if one generation of localized human thinking can radically change on an international scale climate, then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that 7.6 billion people can affect the climate of the whole world. So ping-ponging back over to the other side of the auditorium. Name and question. Uh, hey, Chris, I'm Rob. Um, you famously played Space Oddity on guitar on the sp space station. And I always thought it was super cool and pretty funny that there was a guitar up there. So I guess my question is, are there any other funny objects that might surprise mm -hmm. people that you keep up there? Mm. 
Well, we're just people up there, Rob. You know, we're, we're not automatons. And I think if you, if you think back through history, every vehicle of exploration ever has had musical instruments on board, you know, a harmonica or, or, or something, you know, a little drum or, or a fiddle or, or something, you know, that's where a hornpipe came from was our shipborne explorers, right? And so, uh, so music has always traveled with us everywhere we've gone. And actually, the, it was the, the, the Soviets who put the first musical instruments up because they're, they're much more soulful and, and aware of their own artistic history than Americans are. And, and so they've had guitars up on space. When I was on the Mir space station in 1995, there was a guitar on board that had already been in space for over a decade. They launched it on Salyut 6, I think, and then transferred it to Salyut 7 and then transferred it to Mir, and it was still on Mir. Um, and so they're actually for psychological support. And the guitar that I recorded Space Oddity on uh, was put up there in 2001 by NASA's psychologists and psychiatrists because they recognize that art is important for mental health. It's necessary. And, and you know, work is important, but play is important. And so there are board games up there, but it, of course the pieces float away. So it has to be like a chess board where, where it's magnets or, or the pieces stick. We had a Scrabble game going on the ceiling all the time. It was a perpetual Scrabble game going on. Um, we make up our own games. Think of the games you could invent without gravity. Like hide and seek is great without gravity. And um, we would have races from one end of the space station to the other, you know, go down, touch something and come all the way back. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just a fun and different place. And, and we evolve things differently. There, the Japanese uh, space agency has a whole artistic side to what they're doing. And they promote not just science, but culture uh, on the space station. And there's a beautiful brass, like a gong bell up there. And the beauty of it is you can hold it and you just hit it and then let go. And it just resonates floating weightless and, and, and the sound echoing through the station. I love having you know, that, that ancient sound there in that very technical and very distant place. And we have books on board, paper books to read. We can bring a few. There's a terrific music library on board, of course, but it's all digital. Um, lots of cameras, of course, to take pictures of, of everything. It's home, you know, it's just a, a, a human outpost right in the very edge of civilization. Hi, my name's Oliver, and my question is, what did it feel when you were leaving the Earth's atmosphere? Oliver, I was surprised um, how quickly we left the Earth's atmosphere. Because if, if you go outside now, it's probably uh, dark, but uh, wait until it's a clear day uh, without clouds and look up and, and the color of the sky, really notice the color of the sky. And it's not that much different than the color of my shirt. Um, you know, it's just the, all the little molecules of our atmosphere reflecting the sunlight around and, and filtering it so that the light from the sun ends up striking our eyes in the blue part of the spectrum. So as you rise up through the atmosphere, Oliver, there's less of the air between you and the sun. So there's less molecules bouncing the air around. So the sky color starts to change and it becomes deeper blue, darker blue. And the sky goes from light blue to darker blue to incredibly deep navy blue to black. And it happens in a minute. And, and it's right there looking out your windows. And within a minute, you're above the perceptible air. And now you are in the blackness of space. And, and as, after two minutes and the solid rockets explode off and there's the, the shower of flame all around the vehicle. Um, and then the vehicle rolls over so that our antennas can talk to the ground properly. So with the shuttles upside down, so you can actually see the world and you can look down and see the incredible thinness of our atmosphere down below you. It, it's, if, if, if the world were the size of, you know, of an onion, a big onion, the, the skin of an onion is far thicker, just that one little layer of the onion skin that you peel off than our atmosphere is. It's almost nothing, this tiny little sheath. And you become very aware of that, even while you're flying that rocket ship up above the atmosphere.
What's your name? And ask the question to I Chris. I'm Elisa. And um, we briefly talk about the great progress in um, rocket science, design, and technology. But my question is about uh, psychology and cognition. So what do you think is the biggest challenge for psychology in terms of uh, deep space exploration and mission to Mars? I, it's a really good, thoughtful question. Uh, the beauty of being on board the International Space Station is that the world is always right there in your window. It, it's, it, it, it's, un, it's unavoidable, it's mesmerizing, and it's beautiful, and it constantly changes. But I was thinking about what it's going to be like for the first crew going to Mars, because they will orbit the world a few times, uh, you know, to check everything out. And then they will light their big engine and they will point their tail at the Earth and fire that engine for another, whatever, 10 minutes or something. And then Earth will be in the rearview mirror, getting smaller and smaller. And within just a couple of days or a week, the Earth will be so small that you won't be able to make out any real detail. It will just be a little blue ball, like Mars is a little red ball. And suddenly you are going to be very psychologically separated and alone. And what I realized was if I was the commander of that Martian mission, I would get my crew together as soon as the Earth got small and say, it is really important now, we are no longer Earth things. Earth is just something that happened in our past. We are now Martians. That's who we are. We're on our way to Mars. And we need to think of ourselves that way. We have to self-define differently. It's a little bit like the pandemic. A lot of people have been so in love with being what they were before the pandemic and the pattern of their life and that they pretended that the 18 months of the pandemic was a time out from their life. But the, the psychological toll of that is huge because you feel like you're being robbed of, of something that you used to have in the past. What you have to realize instead is this isn't time out from your life on your spaceship on the way to Mars. This is your life. This is your life. And so accept the limitations of whatever they are, because everyone has limitations on, on their lives. We were not all omniscient and infinitely everywhere all at the same time. We just get used to a set of limitations. And when you have a new set, it's hard to accept them. So astronauts learn to realize that, hey, it's just the confines of my ship, but that's okay. That is my new reality and then build an entire new life of values and expectations and goals and rewards and laughter and life within the confines of the reality of the life that you're having. And when you get to Mars, it'll be something different again. It would be really nice to have a virtual reality, a holodeck like they had uh, on Star Trek Next Generation. It'd be kind of distracting, more, more like a really realistic, you know, novel is, is what a virtual reality is. <laughs> but I think for psychological health, it's absolutely vital to, to accept the reality of the bounds of what life is giving you, and then build an entire life of joy and laughter and success and measure within that. Um, and, and that's true whether you're in a little tiny capsule on the way to, to whatever, Titan, or, or whether you're living in downtown London. To me, it's largely the same. That was a great question to end on. We just have to thank Chris enormously for spending time with us this evening and for, for the writing that you do, the inspiration you offer. Thank you to the audience for coming. So let's give uh, Chris a warm round of applause. <laughs>